Good morning, I'm Valerie Castro, in for Joe Fryer. And hey everybody, good to have you with us. I'm Savannah Sellers right now on Morning News Now, bracing for an influx. This morning, thousands of migrants are gathering on the border between Mexico and the United States just hours before the end of Title 42, a pandemic-era policy that turns away migrants without asylum hearings. We're along the border with how cities and towns are preparing for this next phase and what the Biden administration is doing about it this morning. Defiant, disgraced Congressman George Santos has pleaded not guilty to a string of federal charges, ranging from money laundering to making false statements to Congress. I'm going to fight the witch hunt. I'm going to take care of clearing my name, and I look forward to doing that. I don't understand where the government's getting their information, but I will present but my facts. Well, we're learning about those charges and how his alleged crimes are already impacting his standing on Capitol Hill. Plus, it's official. The COVID public health emergency ends today. And with that, a slew of health rules that have become part of our lives since 2020. We will take a closer look at the restrictions and benefits that go out the window today. Plus, the major lessons we could take away from this pandemic that may prepare us for the possibility of the next. Also this morning on the world stage, a Ukrainian rapper who has spent months fighting for his country is now taking on a totally new mission, the Eurovision Song Contest. How he's planning to bring the Ukrainian spirit to the stage and help others back in his home country. Really more of a tribute there than competing, but it's very cool to see. Exciting to hear about that story. And it's great to have you with us you this too. morning, nice and it's here. good to be with you all at home. Thank you for joining us. We start this morning at the southern border as Title 42 is set to expire tonight. The COVID-era restrictions were first put in place during the pandemic. Border officials have used the Trump-era policy to turn back migrants who are trying to enter the country. And now with the policy ending, several border cities in Texas who have already seen an increase in crossings have declared a state of emergency bracing for a possibly larger influx. Shelters there are already overburdened, and the concern is the situation could get worse. Border Patrol says about more than 60,000 migrants are already in northern Mexico waiting to enter the U.S. when the policy ends tonight. And the conditions they're living in while they wait are brutal. It's a struggle because the food doesn't keep us full. We are hungry and it gets really cold out here. The Department of Homeland Security is taking added steps to help alleviate overcrowding in border facilities. And yesterday, Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas issued this warning to migrants. To people who are thinking of making the journey to our southern border, know this. The smugglers care only about profit, not people. They do not care about you or your well-being. NBC News Homeland Security correspondent Julia Ainsley is on the border in El Paso, Texas for us this morning. Julia, you've been monitoring the situation there. Tell us what you're seeing this morning. Well, it's interesting. I'm here outside Sacred Heart Church in downtown El Paso. And just a few days ago, we would have seen hundreds of migrants sleeping next to each other on these streets. You can still see some have spent the night out here, but it's also we see a lot of clear sidewalks. We understand that immigration authorities came through overnight and asked a lot of these people to be processed, meaning they needed to be sent through the immigration process where they get their A numbers, they get biometrics, they figure out who they are. And then oftentimes they're re-released back to places like this. So we could see them coming back here today. It's something that happened the prior day as well. And it's part of a strategy to try to clear out places like this ahead of that expected surge when at 1059 local here tonight, the, uh, the Title 42 policy will lift and immigrants will be able to come across and claim asylum. Now, a lot of the people who have already come have heard misinformation. They thought they needed to cross before Title 42 lifted. There's a lot of confusion. Uh, but by and large, what this will mean is that as the numbers increase, if more are drawn, when Title 42 lists, they also will be taking longer to process them, that process that I just described, and that could mean more time in detention. Border Patrol is worried about backlogs. In fact, that's why, as we understand and we've reported, they've released a memo to Border Patrol facilities to say you can release people without court dates and without a way to track migrants' whereabouts in the countries in order to alleviate overcrowding if they get pushed too far past capacity. Already just yesterday, or rather two days ago, we understand there were 11,000 
7,000 migrants that crossed in one day. And those numbers could climb to as high as 14,000 or possibly even higher. It's been predicted by the chief of Border Patrol to be about 14,000. They're worried about overcrowding and they're worried about what it might mean for cities like El Paso. And Julia, there's been a lot of concern over misinformation spreading among the migrants about the border process. What resources are available for the migrants to get the correct information? Yeah, that's right. So they talked a lot about how maybe that's the reason why we saw a surge now, even before Title 42 lifts. A lot of times smugglers will tell migrants, today is the day you have to cross. This is your last chance. DHS has actually launched a messaging campaign against that misinformation. You can see billboards now throughout Central America and, and countries where migrants might be coming from telling them, no, this is, this is wrong information. Don't listen to the smuggler. The border to the U.S. is closed. And that's a message that Mayorkas has also been repeating. He repeated that yesterday from this podium. He has repeated that many times, trying to get the message out that the smugglers don't care about you. Don't listen to them. They're just trying to take advantage of you. All right. A lot more to come. Julia Ainsley on the border for us this morning. Julia, thank you. Yeah, powerful reporting there on the ground. Well, the issue of immigration policy here in the U.S. is, of course, a long and complicated one. And Title 42 made it more so challenging lawmakers as well as people, of course, who are trying to come to this country. We want to take a moment to look at how we got to this point and the difficult road ahead. Here's NBC News correspondent Zinkle Esamwa. It's going to be chaotic. Just behind me. Hundreds of migrants conditions here are miserable. Attempting to cross the Rio Grande for weeks. Sleeping on the street. Pushing border communities to the brink. Our resources are stretched and they're stretched quite thin. At the center of it all, Title 42, the public health measure was introduced in 2020 by the Trump administration. Give customers of border protection the tools it needs to prevent the transmission of the virus. Before Title 42, migrants could seek asylum and remain in the United States while their case was being considered. Through CDC emergency powers, Title 42 allowed the government to quickly expel migrants without screening for asylum. Functionally, Title 42 has kind of created a bottleneck of people who are seeking asylum or otherwise kind of seeking entry to the United States. Still, when Biden took office, the policy remained, though their stance has continually shifted. The previous administration separated families and wasted tax dollars. We have been trying to undo that. Uh, we have been trying to make sure that we do it in a moral way. Attempts to end Title 42 in 2022 were met with lawsuits from Republican attorneys general. Then following a surge of migrants, Biden's administration announced an expansion of Title 42, providing some legal pathways for migrants, but also expediting migrant removal. My administration is taking several steps to stiffen enforcement for those who try to come without a legal right to stay. In January, the United Nations saying the move undermines international human rights law. Now in El Paso, Texas, migrants have amassed in the area, waiting for Customs and Border Patrol to process their case. Nonprofit Opportunity Center for the Homeless feeding nearly 1,000 people three meals a day. Their normal capacity closer to 200. Once Title 42 lifts, what's going to happen for you and your work? No matter how prepared we are, we simply aren't going to be prepared for the number of individuals there. While Title 42 may soon be over, the growing humanitarian crisis at the border is far from done. Zinclair Samoa, NBC News. The border emergency is not just an issue for cities and towns in the southern U.S. It's also being felt in big cities hundreds of miles away as migrants arrive by the busload. States of emergency are being declared as resources are being stretched thin. NBC News national correspondent Gabe Gutierrez continues our coverage. This is a place to come and stop, I think. I think it's like the place to stop before you go. The migrant crisis is stretching far beyond the southern border, from New York to Chicago to Philadelphia. And even Denver, where Colorado's governor is asking for the Department of Homeland Security to help inland states. As thousands of migrants are bused from the southern border to cities around the country, the mayor of New York is sparring with the suburbs. The governor also declaring a state of emergency in the state, calling the situation a large-scale humanitarian crisis. She added the city of New York alone is providing temporary housing for almost 37,000 migrants from the southern border, a number that has spiked by more than 12,000 since January and by 1,500 in just the last week. Officials in two nearby counties say Mayor Eric Adams is planning to bus hundreds of single men to stay at local hotels. This is a renegade operation on the part of the mayor, and I, I, can't, I cannot even begin to believe what's going on at this point. 
Those two counties also declaring states of emergency, attempting to block the hotels from accepting the migrants. This seems like the Wild West, and it's very frustrating. Mayor Adams saying the program is part of the city's compassionate response and adding it will provide migrants with temporary housing, access to services, and connections to local communities as they build a stable life. He previously blamed the Biden administration for the influx. The national government has turned its back on New York City. Two hours away in Philadelphia, community organizers are preparing for the next wave. There are human beings inside of those buses. There is no welcome structure at the border, uh, and there's no coordination with local cities to be able to treat people in a human way. But we are ready on our own. Philadelphia's mayor saying a bus with about 31 Venezuelans seeking asylum arrived this morning around 6 a.m., marking 20 buses total since November of last year. And chaotic scenes in Denver, migrants sleeping in a parking garage, but having to clear out for it to be used for basketball game parking. A local college sheltering some inside a church. There's nowhere else for these these refugees to go. Denver's mayor reactivating its emergency operations center to deal with the influx. While Chicago's mayor issues an emergency declaration saying the city is at a breaking point, with more than 8,000 people bust in from other states since last year. This crisis is not only exhausting our city's resources, but it's flat out dangerous for the individuals and families who have been wrapped up in this political stunt. Recent plans to shelter migrants at a former high school sparking backlash. I'm outraged and I don't understand why our community was chosen. NBC Chicago is now reporting all seven temporary shelters in the city are full. Hundreds of migrants now waiting in the lobbies of police stations because they have nowhere else to go. No queremos ser una carga para we just don't want to be a burden, this man says. Not to the government, not to anyone. We want to work hard to be productive members of society. Our thanks to Gabe Gutierrez for that report. And we'll have more on the situation along the border and the end of Title 42 coming up in our next hour. Well, now to the latest on embattled New York Congressman George Santos. He pleaded not guilty to a 13-count federal indictment unsealed yesterday by the Justice Department. The freshman congressman is accused of charges including fraud, money laundering, and theft of public funds. And he could face up to 20 years in prison if convicted. Well, he was released on $500,000 bond, and he must surrender his passport. He is due back in court on June 30th. While well, Santos addressed reporters following his court appearance. I'm going to fight my battle. I'm going to deliver. I'm going to fight the witch hunt. I'm going to take care of clearing my name, and I look forward to doing that. I have my right to fight to prove my innocence, as the government has a right to fight to try to uh, find me guilty in whatever charges. For more, we are joined by NBC News Justice and Intelligence Correspondent Ken Delaney. And Ken, good morning. So viewers might remember there has been a lot going on here. Questions about his heritage, his jobs, his financing, a supposedly sick dog. Well, this appearance mm. lasted just over 10 minutes before he was released. Tell us what he is accused of doing here in these what was unsealed yesterday and remind us how we got to this point. Good morning, Savannah. Well, federal prosecutors in this indictment have accused Santos of really three buckets of illegal conduct. One, they say he defrauded his campaign donors by using campaign money for lavish personal expenses. And they also say he broke campaign law by soliciting donations far larger than the legal limit. And then there's this other charge kind of out of left field. We didn't see this one coming. He's accused of COVID unemployment fraud, of taking $25,000 in unemployment benefits from New York State through the COVID relief program that he was not entitled to. And then lastly, this is a strange one. He's accused of lying on his financial disclosure form, uh, overstating his income, saying he earned $750,000 that prosecutors say he did not earn. I've never seen that before. Usually people hide income. Uh, now, this is, appears on its face to be a very strong case because it's a case that can be proved by documents, uh, bank records, corporation records, tax records, uh, text messages. But Santos remained defiant outside of court yesterday. Take a listen to what he had to say. I don't understand where the government's getting their information, but I will present but my fact. We have an indictment. We have all we have the information that the government wants to come after me on. And I'm going to comply. I've been complying throughout this entire process. I have no desire not to comply at this point. They've been gracious in there. Now I'm going to have to go and fight to defend myself. The reality is, is oh, sorry. it's a witch hunt. 
Now, as you said, each of these money laundering counts carries 20 years in prison. The others carry uh, other prison sentences. He's facing a long stretch, and there's reason to believe these are not the only charges he will face, Savannah. Yes, yeah, so I want to ask you about what else we've got going on with him. So you've just walked us through this 13-count federal indictment. But Santos, uh, we might remember last year, the New York Times did this big investigation that was what brought him under scrutiny and it highlighted these numerous fabrications, some of which I mentioned at the top of this segment. We know he's currently facing other investigations because of those other things. Where do those stand right now? Well, it all sort of runs together. And, and in fact, there's reason to believe that local and state prosecutors are investigating him. We know there's an inquiry by the House Ethics Committee. But usually in this situation, federal prosecutors take primacy here. Um, and what's really interesting, I think, about this indictment is that is this charge of overstating his income. The reason that's important is because he loaned his campaign a large sum of money, more than $600,000. This indictment suggests that that was not his money, and yet there's no mention of it in these particular set of charges. But if it wasn't his money, that suggests there, were, there are other crimes that the federal government is investigating, Savannah. And amid all this, Ken Santos has said he does not plan to resign. In fact, he has announced that he is seeking re-election. Walk us through what this means for him on Capitol Hill. We had a little bit of news yesterday that House Speaker Kevin McCarthy did say he won't support his bid for re-election. But what's next here? Well, so McCarthy needs his vote. So <clears throat> McCarthy right now, even though New York Republicans wish he would resign, McCarthy appears to be standing by his remaining in Congress. And in fact, mm -hmm. you can be in Congress even having been convicted of a felony. It takes a two-thirds vote of the House to expel him. So it really is going to depend on whether the Republican majority decides they can tolerate his presence as he fights these charges, Savannah. All right, Ken, thank you very much. Good to see you. This morning, with no sign of movement to end the debt ceiling standoff, there's growing concern that the nation could default on its debt by the end of the month if Congress doesn't act. Well, yesterday, President Biden took his message directly to the voters. He spoke at a college in upstate New York where he laid the blame squarely on Republicans who he claims refused to negotiate. Take a listen. They're literally not figuring, holding the economy hostage. I made it clear, I made it clear, America is not a deadbeat nation. We pay our bills. NBC News White House correspondent Mike Memoli joins us now on set with more. Mike, good morning. So those morning. were some tough words from the president there. What were some of the other takeaways from that speech? Well, there are a couple things that are really frustrating the president about this whole debt ceiling debate. The first has to do with the specifics of what we're even talking about, federal mm -hmm. spending. The president pointed out that he's put forward a very detailed budget that would cut $3 trillion in federal spending over the next 10 years, what money he would raise more in terms of taxes, what he would cut in terms of federal programs. And then he said Republicans have put up a big number, 4.5 trillion that they want to cut federal spending over the next 10 years, but they haven't specified the details. So one of the things the president did yesterday was try to fill in the blanks for them. Take a listen. According to estimates, the Republican bill would put 21 million people at risk of losing Medicaid. The Republican plan would cut federal law enforcement officers, 30,000, including 11,000 FBI agents, 2,000 border agents, DEA agents, and so on. The other frustration the president has here is, as he pointed out, Republicans passed debt ceiling increases three times during the Trump administration. Mm -hmm. In fact, the last time the deal that led to the deal, debt ceiling being raised increased spending overall. And so he reminded us of what's at stake. He said Republicans' plan here is extreme and doesn't make much sense and talks about the potential for, what, $8 million, $8 million job losses, a 45 percent cut in the stock market if we were to default. Even getting a deal at the last minute, a reminder, would cost 200,000 jobs to the economy. So high stakes that the president really tried to bring to the voters directly yesterday. Definitely, and kind of more drama than we've seen in one of these standoffs in a long time. So with this backdrop that you mentioned about this deadlock between the president and Republicans, it's notable where he was, mm -hmm. a district represented by a Republican, Congressman Mike Lawler. Walk us through what that messaging was there. Yeah, there are 18 of these districts across the country that sent a Republican to Congress last November, mm -hmm. but in 2020 supported President Biden. So these are the definition of swing seats. Mm -hmm. And so the White House had been telegraphed that the president really wanted to come to put pressure on those vulnerable Republicans to maybe relent here, put pressure on Speaker McCarthy to show more willingness to compromise. But there was a very interesting dynamic yesterday. The Republican congressman was in the audience. And in fact, President Biden met with him earlier before he took the stage. He said nice things about him on stage. He said, this is not one of those MAGA Republicans. He's the kind of Republican I used to work with when I was in Congress. So I talked to Congressman Lawler. He talked to reporters after. And he said, well, the president's words speak for themselves. And he put the 
pressure back on the president, said he's the one who needs to show a willingness to compromise. So the politics here continue to be fascinating. Mm. Looking forward, we know the president is scheduled to meet with congressional leaders again tomorrow. Not a lot came out of the last <laughs> meeting. What is the White House hoping for here? Well, what we've heard, and the president said this yesterday as well, is that the staffs, especially the staff for Speaker McCarthy and for the president, have been meeting, will meet again today, are having some good discussions, maybe working slowly towards a deal. But we're also going to continue to see the president trying to put the pressure on today, mm. not in New York, but in the Rose Garden. He's going to be talking about some of the environmental policies he's pursued in office. And then he would fill in more of those blanks, talk about sort of the, the Environmental Protection Agency, the number of staff, what it would mean for our environment if the Republican vision goes through. So you're continuing to see a little bit of carrot, a little bit of stick. Mm. <laughs> now about three weeks to go to that deadline, though. So we got to get some movement here quick. All right, Mike Memoli, thank you so much. All right, come see us again soon. It's fun when you're Feels here like on home. set. I know. <laughs> <laughs> well, overnight, former President Donald Trump appeared in a televised CNN town hall from New Hampshire in front of a crowd of Republican primary voters. And as you might imagine, the current 2024 Republican frontrunner did not hold back. NBC News senior congressional correspondent Garrett Haake joins us now from Washington with what we heard last night. Hey, Garrett, good morning. Hey, Savannah, good morning. Yeah, Mr. Trump appearing at this CNN town hall in New Hampshire, where the audience, according to the network was made up of likely Republican and undecided voters. But it was clear from the jump that this crowd was all in for Trump, cheering him on as he repeated lies about the 2020 election and dug in on January 6th, his civil rape trial, and many of the issues that could decide whether voters will send him back to the Oval Office. Please welcome the frontrunner for the Republican nomination, former President Donald Trump. Overnight, former President Donald Trump, the Republican frontrunner, showing voters he hasn't changed. Mr. Trump again pushing lies and conspiracy theories about the 2020 election he lost, and going further in his support of people convicted of crimes related to the January 6th attack on the Capitol. I am inclined to pardon many of them. I can say for every single one, because a couple of them, probably they got out of control. I would say it will be a large portion of them, you know, they did a very, and it'll be very early on. The former president also describing his supporters who attacked the Capitol on that day, which left five people dead, this way. They were there with love in their heart. That was an unbelievable, and it was a beautiful day. He refused to give an answer on whether he'd back U.S. ally Ukraine. Can you say if you want Ukraine or Russia to win this war? I want everybody to stop dying. Russia invaded Ukraine over a year ago, and the U.S. has backed Ukraine throughout its resistance in one of the major conflicts Mr. Trump would face as president. On another, the economy, Mr. Trump downplaying the consequences of America defaulting on its debts. I say to the Republicans out there, if they don't give you massive cuts, you're going to have to do a default. But while he was president, Republicans voted to raise the debt ceiling three times, allowing the country to borrow more money to avoid default. Economists say defaulting could trigger a massive recession and lost jobs. Pressed on whether he would sign a federal abortion ban in the wake of the Supreme Court overturning Roe versus Wade, Mr. Trump refused to say. President Trump is going to make a determination what he thinks is great for the country. The audience seeming very supportive of Mr. Trump, cheering and laughing throughout the event, including when he continued to attack E. Jean Carroll, just one day after a New York jury found him liable for sexually abusing her in 1996 and for defaming her in his denials of the assault. And I swear to I have no idea who the hell... She's a Mr. whack President, job. You... <laughs> As for President Biden, his campaign responded to the town hall overnight with a tweet reading, It's simple, folks. Do you want four more years of that? While well, urging people who don't to donate to his reelection. Savannah? All right, Garrett Haig, thank you so much. A looming storm is threatening central parts of the country. Let's get a check at your morning news now weather. That means Bill Karens joins us now. He's with us today. Hello, Bill. Good morning. Hello. Great Thursday morning. And uh, unfortunately, not so great in a few spots. We're really watching a horrific drive for your morning in areas like Little Rock, Shreveport. Those are getting just a tremendous amount of rain right now and lightning to you know deal with that, too, especially you know thinking about anyone heading out in the roads. We also have flood watches up from Denver to areas in Nebraska, a little corner there 
of Kansas and up into Montana. But it's really this area down here to the south where all the problems are. Little Rock, you got a thunderstorm right over the top of you. Downpours are coming down. And then if you head down Interstate 30, you get down to Texarkana, head south down to Shreveport. Shreveport has a thunderstorm moving over the top of you, too, and a lot of lightning strikes right over the top of the city. So give it about a half hour or so if you can allow it. If you can do it, you don't want to get stuck out there on the roads, but I'm sure traffic is not going to be good. A lot of people will be delayed. Later today, the biggest concern is going to be severe weather. This one looks like a little more serious than yesterday. Yesterday, we did have about 11 tornadoes reported. A lot of them were what we call land spouts or kind of weak tornadoes. Today is different. Today, we could actually see a few strong tornadoes. The area in yellow is the slight risk. That's where we could experience severe weather. The best chance of any of those stronger tornadoes, and I don't think we're going to have many, maybe only like one or two, but it would be in this hatched area from Dodge City to Wichita, Kansas, southwards down to Oklahoma City. It would be typical late afternoon, early evening, isolated storms. We should have a lot of storm trackers, you know, storm chasers out there watching them, so we'll know where they're heading. But uh, just keep an eye on that if they're anywhere near your area. Other concerns, starting tomorrow, Texas is going to have a lot of water issues. And unfortunately, this goes right through Mother's Day weekend. We have a good chance of flash flooding. Heavy rainfall is heading your way. It's going to start around Del Rio, Sonora, heading over towards San Antonio. And then eventually, this will shift northwards, too, up into areas of North Texas and also into Oklahoma. So here's how we're looking as we talk about your Mother's Day weekend forecast. Let's get into your Friday first. That's where the heavy rain threat's mostly going to be in Texas. Notice the East Coast looking great on Friday. Saturday, New England. England looks great, but watch out for some clouds and rain. Uh, Virginia, Norfolk Beach, D.C., Philadelphia, not the best Saturday afternoon for you. And then Texas, I apologize. As I said, it is going to be a washout weekend right into Mother's Day. Uh, middle of the country, especially around the Midwest, showers in the afternoon, not a washout. The East Coast looks good, especially in the morning, just a few storms in the south. And notice record highs. Find air conditioning. We're going to be in the 90s in mm. the Pacific Northwest wow. for Mother's Day weekend. Oh, God, so. sometimes that can be dangerous in that area. Yeah, you guys all set for Mother's Day? Oh, yeah. I am. You are? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Mine. Are you? And cards. No, I'm looking for, I'm looking for help. Huh? I want to shipped. find people like Savannah that are completely <laughs> done. So. <laughs> no, you know I'm usually at the last minute. Is that why you're like you are? <laughs> no, cards and gifts. I promise I actually shipped them off yesterday to mom Good in California. You. Good job. Which is supposed to be a surprise, but I guess she's going to find out. <laughs> it's not a surprise hey, anymore. <laughs> it was also her birthday this week. Happy birthday, Mom. I know. Oh, that's quite a week her. for you. Yeah. That's stress. <laughs> I know. Get to it, Bill. Thank you so much. Good to have you with us. Well, coming up, we have the latest on the growing violence in Israel this morning. Dozens of Palestinians have been killed, including children, and now there are new concerns the attacks by militant groups are about to increase. That's next. You're watching Morning News Now. We are back with the latest on the violence in Gaza. The Palestinian enclave has been targeted by Israeli airstrikes over the last couple of days. Local health officials say at least 27 Palestinians have been killed, and among the dead are Islamic Jihad militants, as well as many civilians, including women and children. Militant groups responded overnight by firing a volley of rockets towards Israel, but most were either intercepted or missed their target. NBC News foreign correspondent Raf Sanchez joins us from central Israel with more on all of this. So, Raf, we understand Egypt has been trying to broker a ceasefire. What's the latest there and what's the situation on the ground this morning? Yeah, well, despite that talk of a ceasefire, the fighting is continuing for a third day. We are still seeing rockets flying from Gaza into Israel. We are still seeing Israeli airstrikes. And Savannah, yesterday when we were on air together, you could hear explosions behind me in Tel Aviv. What you were hearing was one of these Iron Dome missile interceptors, which has been shooting down a lot of these Palestinian rockets. The Israeli military says some 500 rockets have been fired since yesterday. There have as yet been no casualties on the Israeli side, largely thanks to those Iron Dome missile interceptors. There are casualties on the Palestinian side, though. This morning, Israel says it killed another senior member of Palestinian Islamic Jihad. But there are at least 14 civilians killed in Gaza, most of them killed in that initial wave of Israeli airstrikes. But the Israeli army says a number have also died in the last 24 hours from Palestinian rockets, which have misfired and landed inside Gaza. NBC News has not independently confirmed that. That. But as you said, all eyes now are on Egypt and whether it can mediate a ceasefire that will stick. 
and we'll actually bring an end to this fighting. Guys. Absolutely. And Raf, we know that you will bring us that information should we get there as soon as I do. And please continue to stay safe. I do also want to ask you about something else. Today marks the one year anniversary since the death of Shireen Abu Akleh. She's a Palestinian American Al Jazeera correspondent killed by Israeli forces while covering a raid in the occupied West Bank. I know I understand you've been speaking with her family on this anniversary. What are they saying? Yeah, that's right. The family are saying the same thing they've been saying since day one, really, which is that they want accountability. This has been a devastating year for them, but it has made, been made all the harder knowing that nobody from the Israeli military has been prosecuted for the killing of Shireen Abu Akleh. Nobody has been disciplined, as far as we know. I had a chance to speak to her niece, Lina Abu Akleh, and I want you to take a listen to a little bit of what she had to say. For us, uh, justice is uh, having the soldier who killed her uh, held accountable for the entire chain of command um, to be held responsible uh, for killing Shirin. This is what we want. We don't want another day to go by without justice. We want to be able to go to sleep knowing that the soldier that killed her is held responsible and is, is held accountable for killing uh, my aunt. Now, Lena and her family had the chance to meet with Secretary of State Blinken earlier this year, and they say they want to see the Biden administration do more to get accountability in this case. Guys. And Ralph, where do things stand as far as the FBI's investigation into her killing? Are we seeing any pressure from Congress to move this along? Yeah, so her family, Democrats in Congress, have said what they want to see is an independent, credible investigation, and they do not consider the Israeli military's investigation into its own troops to be independent. So they have pinned their hopes on the FBI, but we're learning this FBI investigation does not appear to be making much progress. The FBI has not spoken to key Palestinian witnesses who were with Shireen Abu Akleh when she was killed, and they're unable to speak to Israeli troops because the Israeli military is refusing to cooperate with this investigation. I spoke to Senator Chris Van Hollen, Democrat from Maryland, who has been a leading voice calling for accountability in this case. And he talked about his frustration that Israel's military is not cooperating with the FBI investigation. Take a listen. I think it's uh, both troubling and disappointing. Um, Israel is a great friend of the United States. Uh, we have an American citizen uh, who was shot and killed, uh, a prominent journalist. Uh, the Secretary of State of the United States has asked for accountability. The President of the United States has asked for accountability. Uh, and we haven't seen anything yet. And the senator's main focus right now is getting congressional access to a classified U.S. military report into Shireen Abu Akleh's killing. He says he hopes Congress will be able to see it sometime in the next couple of weeks. Guys. All right, Raf, thank you for covering so much for us there. And please do stay safe. We'll talk to you soon. Coming up three years later, and we're now at a major turning point in the COVID pandemic. The country's public health emergency ends today. So what does that mean for the benefits we've been receiving since 2020? And what if you don't have insurance? We'll break down how this impacts you and millions of others next. Plus, promising news for kids with peanut allergies, how a skin patch could prevent serious reactions. All that in just a few minutes. Stay with us. Welcome back. Well, after more than three years today, the Biden administration has officially ended the public health emergency around COVID-19. The White House announced it would be doing this back in January, and it's going to mean a series of changes to how the country approaches COVID. It also means the government will no longer be funding some of the free services provided to the public over the last three years. Just last week, the World Health Organization actually made a similar announcement saying the virus is no longer a global health emergency. Take a listen. It's therefore with great hope that I declare COVID-19 over as a global health emergency. However, that does not mean COVID-19 is over as a global health threat. Let's bring in NBC News senior medical correspondent Dr. John Torres for more on this. Dr. Torres, so good to have you with us this morning. So one of the big questions is, does this mean the end of those free COVID tests mm. and the vaccines? How much are we going to have to start paying it for It isn't this? hard to imagine. Three years we went through the pandemic and we had all these things that were given to us 
mandated of us, all right. these different requirements, and those are now going away because of the undeclaring of the public health emergency. When it comes to testing and vaccines, those are probably two of the biggest things. And right now what they're saying is with the testing and the vaccines, the vaccines in particular and the treatments, Paxlovid, the government mm -hmm. has supplies, they have surplus supplies. Once those run out, then there's no longer going to be free vaccines or free testing. And so they're saying, or free vaccines and free treatment. And so we think that might be late summer, early fall. As far as the testing, those free tests are gone now for most people that have insurance or are private pay. But if you have Medicaid, you can still get some free tests at home. Medicare depends on what kind of Medicare you have and, and what, how they handle it. Any other concern for people on those programs or who don't have insurance at all with this change? So the uninsured are going to get the biggest hit right now because the uninsured are going to end up paying for a lot of things they didn't necessarily pay with. with. On top of that, mm -hmm. Medicaid, we know the Medicaid rolls are going to shrink. And by some estimates, 8 to 20 million people are going to be taken off of Medicaid because the rules will be tightened up now that the pandemic, the public health emergency is over. Mm -hmm. But some of the other things, telehealth is one of the big things. And telehealth right now, they've extended a lot of the telehealth provisions that they had during the pandemic. We don't know how long those extensions are going to last and if they're going to continue on and on, especially for prescription drugs, which has proven to be a big thing for people to be able to get those at home instead of having to go in. That was so popular for people during the pandemic just to do that video call with their doctors. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, um, we just talked about that yesterday. Yeah. yeah, exactly. It was. And it's one of those things that I think we're going to see a slow shift in things and then it's going to be a gradually bigger shift in things. And people are going to find out that some of the things they had before, some of the mandates that were there aren't necessarily in place. And so it's going to be fec affecting a lot of people and particularly with trying to get your health coverage. If you had Medicaid before, you're going to have to try and find other health coverage. You know, the, the different things that were available that aren't necessarily available. But the one big thing to remember is the public health emergency is over. The pandemic, the virus is still there. We're still seeing 10 to 20,000 cases a day, 1 to 200 deaths a day in this country. And globally, there are some hot spots that are continuing to crop up which means keep on top of your vaccines. That's one of the things you have to do. Again, that vaccine supply we think will last through the summer or fall. If they change the booster and change the way it's made or the different formulations of the booster, then those supplies aren't going to work anymore. So it's going to be through your own private insurance or through private pay. We don't have much time left, but I do want to ask you, given what we learned from this program, everything that did or did not work, the way that we handled it, are we prepared for if something like this happens again? We're better prepared for it. And what usually happens with these things, we've had many pandemics in the past, is we usually end up being very prepared for the next year or two, and then the funding slowly starts slipping away and we get caught again okay. like we were caught this time. And so hopefully we've learned a lesson because this was a huge pandemic that affected the world, and hopefully we learned a lesson. I certainly hope that. Dr. John Torres, always great to have you here you in New bet. York with us. Thank you so much. Thank you. And we now have more major medical news that could provide relief for toddlers with peanut allergies. NBC News correspondent Dana Griffith, Griffin explains with more on a patch that can help protect kids. When Sarah Qureshi's daughter, Zara, was just nine months old, she discovered she had a deadly peanut allergy. The first thing I thought was my child is going to die. I went through a lot to have Zara, and it felt in that moment like she was being taken away from me. While there are options for peanut allergy sufferers over the age of four, up until now, there's been almost nothing that could be done to help allergic toddlers. A breakthrough therapy researchers say will save lives. This is really aimed at providing an accidental exposure buffer. It's a patch for one to three year olds that delivers peanut protein to the skin, working to desensitize some of the youngest peanut allergy sufferers. Your child is gaining protection. You have to have more peanut to cause a reaction. According to the study published in the New England Journal of Medicine, after one year on the patch, 67% of toddlers increased the amount of peanuts they could safely ingest. That's double compared to kids that just got the placebo. With few serious adverse reactions in the phase three trial, doctors say the results are promising, but do offer caution, saying this isn't a cure, but a life-saving tool for children who are accidentally exposed to peanuts. Oh, it would be huge. A patch where we're not even thinking about it, where she doesn't have to think about it or feel anxiety would be amazing. A patch offering parents peace of mind. Dana Griffin, NBC News. Major breakthrough there. Good news for families. Well, coming up on Morning News Now, a royal apology. One of the UK's biggest newspapers apologizes to Prince Harry for hacking his phone. More on that and the other celebrities who were allegedly targeted. That's coming up next.
We're back now with some financial headlines. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen has a few thoughts on the debt ceiling with high stakes negotiations now underway. That's right. CNBC Markets reporter Pippa Stevens joins us now for the latest on that and any other money news we should know this morning. Hey, Pippa, good morning. Hey, Savannah. Well, Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen says the, no the notion the United States would default on its debt is, quote, unthinkable. Speaking ahead of the G7 finance ministers meeting today in Japan, Yellen said she's aware of the comment by former President Trump that Republicans should let the nation default. She says that would badly undermine the U.S. and global economy, and Congress must raise the debt ceiling. Yellen has warned the U.S. government could run out of cash and measure to be able to pay its bills as soon as June 1st. Meantime, Disney will make content from Hulu available on Disney Plus later this year. It's the latest effort by CEO Bob Iger to get the company's streaming business to profitability. Iger says Disney Plus, Hulu and ESPN Plus will remain available as standalone options. But he says the one app offering will provide greater opportunities for advertisers and make it easier for consumers to navigate Disney's content libraries. Iger also plans to raise prices further for the ad-free version of Disney Plus in a bid to drive more people to the cheaper ad-supported tier. And Google is bringing Waze, YouTube, Zoom and other apps to cars that have Android software built in. The company is also creating an app library so third-party developers can build their own program for Android-equipped vehicles. Some of the features, including YouTube, will be available in the coming weeks starting with people who own Volvo and Pol Polestar models. I'm not really sure why you need YouTube on your car's <laughs> console, but totally agree. I was just wondering that. I'm surprised that's allowed. <laughs> it seems like a safety hazard, but that's a conversation for another time. <laughs> Pippa, thank you so much. Thank you. Britain's Mirror Group newspapers has apologized to Prince Harry for unlawfully gathering information on his private life at the start of a trial which could see the prince take to the witness stand. Harry is just one of a group of high-profile figures suing the publisher of the Daily Mirror tabloid. They allege its journalists obtained confidential information by, get this, hacking their phones, among other illegal methods. MGN, as it's called, is contesting some of the accusations. They argue some have been brought to late. Journalist and broadcaster Afia Hagen joins us now for more on this. Good morning. Thank you for joining us. So first off, help us understand what this case is all about. The types of celebrities involved, who else are we talking about and what exactly they're alleging? What is phone hacking? Well, there is a lot of people involved in this case. Of course, we have Prince Harry, uh, the Duke of Sussex, and we also have actresses that are probably well known uh, here in the United Kingdom, like Nikki Sanderson, who was on a, a soap opera called Coronation Street, along with some of her fellow actors and actresses that are in this particular court case. Remember, he does have a case against another newspaper group as well. And this relates to phone hacking. Uh, and between 1996 and 2010, about 138 articles are written, and these are the ones that his lawyer, Prince Harry's lawyer, David Sherborne, is talking about in court this particular time. And so phone hacking relates to hacking into people's voicemails using a four-digit code, which people often have but don't change, which is a very easy code to guess. And it's alleged that people at newspapers, including Piers Morgan, who is the editor of the Daily Mirror newspaper during the time that Prince Harry is talking about between 19 1996 and 2010, and basically saying that journalists were hacking into his voicemails to be able to listen to private voicemails that he would have been left or he had left other people. Prince Harry also says that during this time he got a lot of strange calls from numbers and a lot of hung up calls as well. And this caused a lot of distress and a lot of commotion uh, and a lot of problems in his private life with his relationships, especially with Chelsea Davy. in 2010, she said she decided that a royal life was not for her because of so many stories that appeared in the newspapers that were related to things that they had done that only they could know about. And those stories came about because of phone hacking. Mm. And Afia, we know Sky News and the BBC are reporting that Prince Harry is expected to appear in court mm. and give evidence next month. How unprecedented is it for a royal family member to testify in person yeah. like this? And what does this tell us about his relationship with the media? I mean, it's completely unprecedented to have a member of the royal family going up against the press like this. We know that they have a special relationship. And we know that the royal family doesn't really go up against the press because they need the press 
for positivity, to write nice stories about them. So it's completely unprecedented. And it shows that Prince Harry's relationship with the press, especially the UK tabloid press, is at an all-time low. It's very, very fractured. Remember, in his interviews for his memoir, Spare, he talked about how it was his life's work to make sure that the press operated properly. And he wanted to bring certain people to justice. He wanted to make sure that the press couldn't get away with phone hacking, with writing stories that weren't true about himself or other people. So to see him in court in June is going to be unprecedented, but we can expect it to be quite explosive as well. Yeah, something we heard a lot about from Harry as well as his wife, Meghan Markle, in that Netflix docuseries, including chronicling a lawsuit of her own against a tabloid. Afia, thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate your expertise this morning. Coming up, turning signs into works of art. That's right, a street artist in New York City has taken those paper signs, you know, that you'll see on a light pole, and giving them a major upgrade. That's next. Beyonce kicked off her massive Renaissance World Tour in Sweden last night, her first solo tour since 2016. The audience at Stockholm's Friends Arena got a first look at the ambitious staging. It included video projections, elaborate costume changes, and even an inflatable horse, a nod to the cover of her Grammy-winning album Renaissance. Her tour includes stops in more than 40 other cities like London, Paris, and Barcelona, and ends in New Orleans in September. And between Beyonce and Taylor Swift, there's just so many good shows out there, Savannah, I know. as you know. Well, first, <laughs> yes, I was at the Taylor Swift show. Oh, my goodness. Also, Valerie, two of my best friends were there last night. They're in Stockholm. They flew there, as we talked about yesterday. Wow. It was so much cheaper to do that than get tickets here. They had the time of their lives. They're also going again tonight because they were able to get tickets. It's get amazing. A vacation it's out of it. Sounds yeah, exactly. great. Exactly. Thanks, Valerie. Well, now to Europe, where a Ukrainian rapper turned soldier is heading from the front lines to the main stage at the Eurovision music competition. NBC News correspondent Ellison Barber has his story. On stage, he's a toy. Here, he's Slava, a 24-year-old Ukrainian born in Lviv, the rapper who traded his microphone for a gun and volunteered to fight against Russia. War is his new reality, but his passion is here in the studio. Has your music changed since the full-scale invasion began? At a little bit of hate and a little bit of aggression. In Ukraine, you don't need to imagine anything because that's a movie happening outside every day. The life that you're living here, I can say it's 100% rap. A toy is driven by a deep love for Ukraine, rage against the war, and an unwavering belief in this country's future. This week, he'll take all of it to Europe's biggest stage. The manager that I'm working with called me and she said, you're going to perform on Eurovision. And I was like, are you joking me? Like me, a rapper on Eurovision. The performance, like most of his music, will be defined by his culture. I can say it's Ukrainian rap, like fully Ukrainian. I'm not trying to make a folk music. I'm trying to make a rap bad with Ukrainian roots. And the brutality of war. How many people have you lost that are close to you, friends, family members, since the full-scale invasion began? I think close to 20. Like, really close friends. Um, I lost my brother. His brother gave his life defending the city of Mariupol. For 80 days, Ukrainian forces at the Azovstal steel plant resisted an unrelenting Russian assault. They were surrounded, outnumbered, outgunned, but they refused to surrender. Eurovision's lights can be daunting. 180 million people are expected to tune in. But Otoy says he will rap for one. When you're on that stage, who will that performance be for? I think that will be a performance for a son of my brother. I just wanted him to look at it and to understand what I'm going to talk about in the lyrics, because he will definitely understand what I'm talking about. 
That was Ellison Barber reporting. You can watch the semifinals today on the Peacock app. The grand finale is Saturday. Looks interesting. Mm -hmm. And we end this hour with the story of a New York City artist who has been completely overhauling local posters all incognito. But now he's speaking out. NBC News correspondent Emily Aketa has his story. From the corner of this Brooklyn coffee shop, Mika's, a 24-year-old artist feverishly putting pen to pad, redesigning the city streets incognito. Color combinations, good fonts. Earlier this year, Max Kolomatsky was stuck in a creative rut, but found inspiration in the collage of slapdash ads taped to light posts and storefront windows. Most of them you don't even notice. And honestly, that's a pretty telltale sign that it could use some work. And so for fun, he started drawing life into those lackluster signs. If a sign can catch your eye, that's the difference between you knowing about something and you not knowing about something. It started with the flyer for game night and then ads for refrigerator and stove work, a handyman, even a band. Printing and posting his new and improved versions next to the originals. Why do it anonymously, incognito? I really like imagining somebody coming back to their sign and there's one right next to it with the same information but just professionally designed. I think it's just a uh, poof. An element of surprise. An element of surprise, yes. He shared his process on social media and captivated millions with his Spider-Man-esque effort. Were you surprised by the response to your initial videos? Absolutely. I had no idea it would be um, at the scale that it is now. And for the first time, hey, how's it going? Kolomatsky presented his signs to a small business in person. I wow. drew these out if you're interested. It didn't take long for Eric Bautista to swap out the signs for his family's one-year-old business, El Camado. It gives hope in, in people that people still do care about other ones. An artist's touch, inspiring hope, one stroke at a time. Emily Iketa, NBC News, New York. I'll be looking for those around I know, the city now. So neat. <laughs> that does it for this hour of Morning News Now. But the news continues right now. Hey everybody, good morning. Thanks for joining us this Thursday. I'm Savannah Sellers. And I'm Valerie Castro in for Joe Fryer. Right now on Morning News Now, looming deadline. This morning, U.S. troops are amassing on the southern border ahead of tonight's expiration of that COVID-era immigration restriction known as Title 42. We're on the ground with the latest scenes of desperation and confusion as migrants battle rumors and misinformation about what will happen next. Indicted, Republican Congressman George Santos is back in Washington this morning after pleading not guilty to more than a dozen federal charges yesterday. I'm going to fight my battle. I'm going to deliver. I'm going to take care of clearing my name, and I look forward to doing that. More on what he's accused of, plus what it all means for his future on Capitol Hill and the Republican Party in Congress. Also this morning, a key vote by FDA advisors on birth control, unanimously recommending a widely used medication be made available without a prescription. We'll take a look at what's next, when we could see a final decision from the FDA, and what it means for the future of contraceptives in America. Plus, high altitude havoc later in the hour, a health warning from one of our own here at NBC News, Morgan Chesky, will bring you his story of an ordinary hiking trek in Utah that ended in the ICU. Mm. So scary when something like that happens and you're not expecting it. Absolutely. So. We're so happy he's okay and so awesome that he's giving some people help, you know, to look out for certain things. So it's great to hear from him. Good to be with you this morning. We start at the southern border where immigration officials are preparing for the end of Title 42 tonight. That's right. Migrants are lining up along the northern Mexico border, hoping to cross over into the U.S. once the policy is lifted. But it's not going to be an easy process. NBC News Now anchor Tom Yamas is covering all the latest developments from the border. Overnight, the border getting fresh reinforcements. Armed U.S. troops building a new layer of barbed wire fencing just steps from Juarez. With the pandemic-era Title 42 set to expire at midnight, the crowds of migrants gathering here are growing. Border officials estimate up to 65,000 migrants may be in northern Mexico waiting to cross. This places an incredible strain on our personnel, our facilities, and our communities on Tuesday, more than 11,000 illegal border crossings in just 24 hours. We have a dangerous and deadly national security crisis unfolding at our southern border. And the crisis is soon to become a catastrophe. 
desperate scenes in El Paso, including children living on the streets. At the border, a confusing scene. Migrants waiting for days to get processed, but access to entry points in some ways opening up. It's unclear why, but it's probably for safety reasons that a portion of that barbed wire fence, which is on the U.S. side just before the border wall, has been cut out. Now migrants who cross illegally can freely walk up to that border wall in hopes of somehow being processed. And the journey to the border not getting any easier, even for those just steps from the U.S. Extreme winds kicking up blinding dust, blanketing everything in sand. And those that do make it over will find new rules post-Title 42. In an attempt to monitor the countless families crossing illegally, ICE now announcing they will offer a new alternative to detention, including a GPS monitor for the head of the household and a curfew. But families that don't qualify for asylum will be deported. You think it's going to be harder to get in? You think it's going to be more difficult to enter after the week? The end of Title 42 worries the Castro family. For five months, they've lived in a shelter, escaping a cartel they say wanted to kidnap their 13-year-old daughter. They registered for an asylum hearing this Saturday using the new CBP app, though they say they had to take a class to learn how to use it. Do you think you're going to get asylum? Do you think they're going to get asylum? Thank you to Tom Yamas for that report. And we're going to stay on this. We have Louis Miranda, Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary for Communications for the Department of Homeland Security, joining us now with more on how immigration officials are preparing for the end of Title 42. Good morning. We very much appreciate you joining us today. Thank you. Good morning, so Savannah. Homeland Thank you. Security officials predicted 10,000 migrants will try to cross into the U.S. per day after Title 42 lifts. But let's just talk about the sheer volume that we're already aware of. We know border crossings have surpassed that with 11 thousand migrants apprehended on Tuesday alone. Is the Department of Homeland Security prepared to deal with the influx of migrants we are likely to see in the coming days and already seeing stack up before this has even ended? Savannah, we've been preparing for over a year and a half for the end of Title 42 and to make sure that we have the resources, uh, the uh, systems, the uh, modern processing in place to be able to adapt uh, and scale as necessary. Uh, we're not looking at one specific projection. What we're looking at is how can we make sure that we have the resources that we need, where we need them, when we need them, and how do we make sure that we're expanding lawful pathways to make sure that people are not trying to cross uh, illegally and that they they are not putting their lives in the hands of smugglers. You were just talking about in, your, in, the, in the package uh, just before this about the exploitation that migrants can potentially suffer from cartels uh, that are involved in, in the smuggling business. And, and uh, that's not something we want to see. So what we've done is we're working across the hemisphere with our partners to set up regional processing centers in other countries to make sure that we're also uh, using parole processes that people uh, can have a sponsor here in the United States so that they can fly in legally uh, after being screened and vetted. Uh, we're making sure that we're also working with partners to shut down some of the irregular movement through the Darien uh, with Colombia and Panama helping uh, uh, moving their resources into place there. And so th there's a lot of work to make sure that we're both reducing the flow, creating lawful pathways, and showing that when Title VIII kicks in, what's going to happen is we're actually going to get to enforce our laws. Title 42 was a Band-Aid. It didn't allow us to impose consequences, mm -hmm. uh, such as prosecution for recidivism, uh, such as a five-year bar on reentry. Uh, and, and so we're sending a strong message. We've also tightened uh, the, the rules on uh, asylum so that we can make sure that if someone doesn't meet certain conditions, uh, we can uh, have that uh, screening process happen much more quickly. Uh, and, and, and that way we can uh, send a strong message and, and be able to keep people in lawful pathways instead of working with smugglers. Yeah, so I understand that that screening process is part of something here that we just learned yesterday. NBC News learning that the Biden administration plans to release migrants into the U.S., some migrants, I should say, without court dates and also without a way to track them. It seems that this is a way to alleviate overcrowding. It seems that would lead to confusion and also, of course, be difficult to keep tabs on migrants who cross. What do you say about that? Again, keeping in mind, I understand it, it, it's a small, specific group, but does that kind of defeat the purpose of some of the bigger processes we have here? What do you have to say about that? 
Now, look, uh, administrations from both parties for decades have relied on uh, these kinds of parole releases as necessary, and it's only in very limited cases where capacity has been far exceeded. Um, we are over capacity in certain sectors, but we have uh, are not having to use that uh, in, in, in most cases because uh, we do have uh, more processing capacity. We just opened two new processing facilities in the last couple of days. Uh, we've deployed, uh, as you've noted, uh, 15 1,500 additional uh, DOD personnel uh, have been deployed in support of our, our mission at DHS uh, to be able to provide uh, processing support um, with data entry, uh, other monitoring of, of, of the technology that we have on the border. So there is a, a lot at play. We've deployed another 1,400 uh, federal personnel who are supporting. And uh, in the past year and a half, one of the things that the Secretary has done is, as he listened to and worked with the workforce and Border Patrol, is that we've also created a new uh, Border Patrol processing coordinator position where we've brought on over 1,000 people uh, who are uh, employees who are helping Border Patrol so that they can take off a lot of of that processing uh, demand and Border Patrol can get back on the line uh, and do their law enforcement mission. So yes, but uh, we feel that we're if very If I may prepared. just interject there, um, for those who are part of this select group, is it true, though, that there would not be a way to track them? Uh, well, they have obligations. Any kind of release that we do, uh, regardless of how it's done, when and there's different pathways um, throughout, you know, our immigration laws. Uh, what what happens is that uh, people are in removal proceedings. They have to go uh, to court, and in that process, as they await their immigration court proceedings, they have to consistently check in with Immigrations and Customs Enforcement. If they don't check in, we will go and uh, detain them and and remove them uh, expeditiously. So there are conditions. Uh, and again, this is a very limited uh, guidance in, in mm -hmm. case that it's needed. But the vast and majority, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be processing them. And if they do not have a legal basis to stay in the United States, uh, they will be quickly removed. And may I also ask you about that app that we just heard about a moment ago from my colleague, Tom Yama. Mm -hmm. So part of this new immigration policy, anyone who wants to apply for asylum is required to make an appointment through an app. A couple questions, though. If a migrant doesn't have access to a phone, we've also heard reports of glitches, setbacks, people having to take a course to even learn how to use the app. Is that actually going to work smoothly? We just have a few seconds. I'm so sorry, but could you just tell us it's, how it's you're preparing worked incredibly, to use that? It's worked incredibly well in the first four months. 83,000 people were able to schedule appointments. Um, uh, the, the glitch is that people want more appointments than there are available, but the reality is that it's working very well, cutting out smugglers, cutting out middlemen by allowing migrants to have a direct way to schedule an appointment. That's very powerful, uh, and we've made it available in multiple languages. We work with shelters and other service providers uh, on the other side of the border to make sure that we do provide mm -hmm. information so that people know how to use it, and, and we're going to continue to do that. Louis Miranda, Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary for Communications for the Department of Homeland Security. We very much appreciate your time on what is, of Thank course, you, a busy week for you all. Thank you for joining us. Mm -hmm. As we've mentioned, rumors and misinformation are spreading among migrants making their way north, some even telling our reporters that they arrived at the border believing it would be completely open today. Our coverage continues now with NBC News correspondent Guad Venegas. As the end of Title 42 looms, the people most impacted seem to be the most in the dark about what it means for them. So she's heard that the border is going to open when Title 42 is lifted. Muy confuso, porque en realidad no, como he dicho, no no tengo muy buena claridad al respecto de este tema. One migrant shaking his head in confusion when asked if he knew what Title 42 is. No, no have idea. Now, the U.S. government trying to step in. Secretary of Homeland Security Alejandro Mayorkas announcing a new campaign in Central and South America to combat misinformation. Smugglers have long been hard at work spreading false information that the border will be open after May 11th. It will not be. They are lying. Desperate migrants hopeful they will get into the U.S. and be allowed to stay but also uncertain about what to expect. There are many people who arrive here who just don't know what it means to um, be waiting for Border Patrol to process them. While a lot of rumors spread on social media, we provide Know Your Rights. And immigration attorney Nicole Ramos runs an organization using those popular platforms to educate migrants on policy. Rumores de CBP1. Hay muchos rumores divulgados en la zona fronteriza. In order to be considered to enter the U.S. to begin the asylum process, asylum seekers need to make an appointment. 
the Biden administration rolling out a regulation that could disqualify those who cross into the U.S. illegally from claiming asylum. It presumes certain migrants are ineligible if they pass through other nations without seeking protection there first, as many do on their journey from Central and South America. If you're able to schedule an appointment through the CBP-1 app, you can actually get an exception and still be able to apply for asylum. The problem here is that the CBP-1 app doesn't work really well. As we have seen firsthand on the ground. It says, please choose, he has a Spanish, please choose date and time. But then it says, there's no date and time available. Come back tomorrow at 10 a.m. In these Mexican border cities, lack of clarity on immigration policy is replaced with optimism and a dream for a better life. Bueno, tenemos la, la esperanza, la, esper la fe de que nos van a dejar entrar antes del 11. Our thanks to Guad Venegas for that reporting. We will have much more coverage of the end of Title 42 throughout the morning and the rest of the day here on News Now. Well, not in Washington, where New York freshman Congressman George Santos is pushing back against federal charges against him. Santos pleaded not guilty to the 13-count indictment by the Justice Department. He potentially faces years behind bars if he's convicted. NBC News correspondent Stephanie Gosk has the latest. Hey there, George Santos' hearing lasted just 10 minutes with federal prosecutors laying out a laundry list of serious charges against him. Most defendants in a federal case might run from the cameras, but when the hearing was over, Santos went straight to them and vowed he was going to fight. George Santos mobbed by cameras outside federal court moments after pleading not guilty to 13 federal charges. I'm going to fight the witch and I'm going to take care of clearing my name and I look forward to doing that. The freshman congressman says he won't resign and intends to run for re-election, even posting on Twitter moments after his indictment looking for campaign donations. House Speaker Kevin McCarthy, who has not called on Santos to resign, made it clear his support would come to an end in the next election. Are you going to support him? You're not. Federal prosecutors accuse Santos of wire fraud, money laundering, making false statements to the House of Representatives, and theft of public funds. Among the accusations, he collected over $24,000 in New York unemployment benefits during the pandemic, even though he was earning $120,000 from a company in Florida. Santos also allegedly used thousands of dollars in campaign contributions to pay for personal expenses, like credit card payments and designer clothes, according to the indictment. Congressman, did you take campaign donations and use that money to buy expensive suits? No, I did not. This campaign was never about In the 2022 midterms, Santos became the first openly gay Republican elected to Congress. But he ran on a made-up resume, including a college degree he never received and jobs on Wall Street he never had, ultimately admitting that some of it was fabricated. Did I embellish my resume? Yes, I did. And I'm sorry. After the federal indictment was unsealed, residents in Santos's district mostly split along party lines. He definitely should not be in office. This is not someone that I want to represent me. If he has to quit for lying, everybody else does. And we're going to have an empty capital. Congressman Santos has been released on a $500,000 bond. His travel will be restricted from New York to D.C., and he had to turn over his passport. His next court date is June 30th. Back to you. Quite the talker and a lot to unpack there. Stephanie, thank you so much. Well, just one day after being found liable for sexual abuse, former President Donald Trump was back in the spotlight in a CNN town hall last night. For many viewers, the 70-minute interview provided their first long look at the front runner for the Republican nominee since he left the Oval Office. But the message was mostly the same with the former president talking about his own record, inflating it, and repeating lies about the 2020 election. That was a rigged election, and it's a shame that we had to go through it. It's very bad for our country. All over the world, they looked at it. It was not a rigged election. It was not a stolen election. You and your supporters lost more than 60 court cases on the election. It's been nearly two and a half years. Can you publicly acknowledge that you did lose the 2020 election? Let me, let me just go on. If you look at True the Vote, they found millions of votes on camera, on government cameras, where uh, they were stuffing ballot boxes. Republican officials debunked those claims about fraudulent ballots. 
For more, we are joined by NBC News correspondent Vaughn Hilliard. He's in Manchester, New Hampshire. This is where the event was held last night. Hey, Vaughn, good to see you. So it's the first time we've really seen Trump outside the conservative media ecosystem, or we're hearing from him not on his own app, but this room was stacked with Republican supporters of his. We heard them cheering many times throughout the night. What were your main takeaways? I think that it's important context. We have really not seen Donald Trump do a serious interview with the non-right-wing outlet since before he left the White House in 2020. And so for the public last night, this was a, a 28 months of Donald Trump condensed into just about an hour. Lies about the 2020 election, his suggestion when asked about whether he believes Ukraine or Russia should win the war, he demurred, refusing to answer multiple follow-ups on that question. He refused to answer the specifics of what a federal abortion ban that he'd sign into law would look like. Uh, he mocked E. Jean Carroll, the woman who he was found liable to have sexually abused and defamed uh, just two days earlier. Uh, you know, for Donald Trump, this was uh, a very much a grievance-filled event. I want to let you hear when he was asked specifically about whether he would pardon January 6th defendants who stormed the Capitol on January 6th. Take a listen. A question to you is, will you pardon the January 6th rioters who were convicted of federal offenses? Uh, I am inclined to uh, pardon many of them. I can't say for every single one, because a couple of them, probably, they got out of control. What they've done to these people, they've persecuted these people. And yeah, my, my answer is, I am most likely, if I get in, I will most likely, I would say it will be a large portion of them. A large portion. Donald Trump has held up these individuals as being unfairly prosecuted making it a comparison to himself as he has faced these multiple investigations a month after his arrest in New York City. For Donald Trump, this is about galvanizing a base of support that he has found in this country here. The question is, uh, to what extent did the rest of the country mm -hmm. uh, view that as a sympathetic figure or as one we're fighting against? Vaughn, how is this being taken from Republicans on Capitol Hill? Right. When I say we're fighting against, so this is really a conversation about the Republican Party because there are alternatives running for president of the United States against Donald Trump ahead of next January, February, the primaries that are to begin. I, you know, it's notable that it's actually the New Hampshire governor here, Chris Sununu, who just about a half hour after the town hall ended, called Donald Trump bitter, weak, full of lies, and in the most direct way yet took on Donald Trump. Sununu himself said that he is considering jumping into this presidential race here. And it'd be notable because there has been really a lack of notable Republicans that have really tried to take on Donald Trump. Uh, you ask about Capitol Hill. There's really been silence over the last 12 hours since the town hall uh, came to its uh, conclusion here. So the, the question comes down ultimately Republican voters of whether they want Donald mm -hmm. Trump to be their nominee or turn to a potential alternative like the New Hampshire Governor Chris Sununu. That's right. Big question. How do primary voters take this? Vaughn Hilliard, thank you so much. Time now for a check at your morning news now weather. Which means it's time for Bill Karens to join us again with your forecast. Hello, Bill. Hey, so this Thursday is going to be active. Possible tornadoes later on this evening. And not like yesterday. Yesterday we did have 11 tornadoes reported, but a lot of them were weak or what we call land spout tornadoes. You typically, even if they hit anything, don't do a lot of damage. Today it could be different. So we're already waking up. This is Oklahoma. This is North Texas. This is Wichita Falls. Already waking up to some thunderstorms in this region. These are from last night. These will eventually die off, and then we'll have new storms popping up later later on this afternoon, this evening. A large area here from Wichita Falls all the way back up into southern portions of South Dakota. But it's this orange section in here that's the greatest risk of tornadoes and maybe even an isolated strong tornado or two. Of course, the strong ones, those are the ones that you know usually kill the most people, do the most damage if they hit populated areas. So the risk for EF2 tornadoes, we rank the tornadoes from a EF0 all the way up to a EF5. Uh, you know, EF2 plus, those are the ones that can at least take like the top half of a house off. So that's why when we have a chance of these, they get very serious, especially if they're in the you know after dark. So from Dodge City to Wichita, southwards Oklahoma City, storm 
chasers will be out here later on this afternoon, this evening. If we have any on the ground, the sun sets so late now that we should have a good idea of where they are and where they're going. So make sure you, if you live in that area, stay tuned. Uh, your NBC station or your, you know, right here with us, we'll try to update you as best we can. So slight risk tomorrow. This is Des Moines to Kansas City, also from Oklahoma City southward. So we got two days in a row and notice 17 million people as we go into Friday. Not as many tornadoes, but large hail possible for a good section near of Texas. The other story, summertime. Air conditioners going on. Ohio Valley, D.C. to New York, one of the warmest days we've had in a while. The humidity is not too bad, though, and temperatures tomorrow could be almost near 90 in areas like New York City, and it's going to stay pretty warm as we head even through Mother's Day weekend in many areas of the east. So we can, uh, you know, put away those jackets for a while. So I have to ask you guys a question about Mother's Day weekend. Mm. <laughs> Do you prefer brunch or well. dinner for, to take mom? If you have your choice. Uh, well, I wish I could do either with my mom, who's in California, but I would say brunch. You're I'm brunch doing brunch. both. I'm doing dinner with my mother Saturday and then brunch with the family on Sunday. Oh, over what about you? She's over at you. She's doing both. <laughs> what about you? I'll, I usually do brunch, but this year I'm going to try the dinner. We'll yeah. see how it goes. All right, there you I'll go. Maybe you know. less of a crowd, you know? I don't know. Oh, great. So it's not going to be fun? So no, be like no, two I'm just saying. No, it'll be, it'll be... That's enough. Thank you, Bill. Always good to have you with us, even when you're trolling us. Coming up on Morning News Now, a major development this morning in the high-profile disappearance of Natalie Holloway. Why Jordan Vandersloot, one of the last people to see Holloway alive, will be extradited to the U.S. Plus, the widely used birth control pill could soon be available without a prescription. The new recommendation from FDA advisors and what it could mean for millions of Americans. Next. This morning, a new development in the mystery behind the unsolved 2005 disappearance of teenager Natalie Holloway. That's right. I can't believe it's been that long. Well, a lead suspect in the case, Jordan Vandersloot, will be extradited to the U.S. to face charges. But in another case, NBC News correspondent Kristen Dahlgren joins us now with this update. Hi, Kristen. Good morning. Hey, good morning. Yeah, Natalie Holloway, guys, would be 36 years old wow. today. Mm -hmm. uh, her case, the subject of endless media attention over the years. It's been more than a decade since Jordan Vandersloot was federally charged in the U.S. with wire fraud and extortion. He's in prison in Peru for the murder of another woman, but will now face those charges here after the government of Peru agreed to extradite him. <sighs> Nearly 20 years since the sudden disappearance of 18-year-old Natalie Holloway, Joran Vandersloot, the prime suspect in the case, according to authorities, will be sent to Birmingham, Alabama, where he'll face federal wire fraud and extortion charges dating back to 2010. Overnight, the government of Peru approving his temporary extradition. Vandersloot was seen leaving a nightclub with Holloway in May of 2005, the night she vanished. No one has ever been charged in her disappearance, and her body was never found. In 2012, an Alabama judge signed an order declaring Holloway legally dead. Natalie's mother, Beth Holloway, releasing a statement overnight, writing in part, It has been a very long and painful journey, but the persistence of many is going to pay off adding, together we are finally getting justice for Natalie. In 2010, Vandersloot allegedly reached out to the Holloway's attorney, promising to not only explain what happened to Natalie, but where to find her remains, in exchange for a quarter of a million dollars. Vandersloot was wired $25,000 as part of an FBI sting, eventually leading to the current wire fraud and extortion charges against him. Authorities believe Vandersloot used the money to flee to Peru, where months later he was arrested for the murder of 21-year-old Stephanie Flores, who died on the fifth anniversary of Natalie's disappearance. He was convicted in 2012 and has been serving a 28-year prison sentence. Beth Holloway talking to Savannah in 2015. Does it feel like justice to you that he is in jail right now, even if not for the, the killing of your daughter? Justice is being served for Stephanie. But until Iran faces the extortion charges in the U.S., and justice is not being served for Natalie. Now, NBC News has reached out to the U.S. attorney for comment, but no response. Overnight, Peru's ambassador to the U.S. released a statement that reads, in part, we hope that this action will enable a process that will help to bring peace to Mrs. Holloway and to her family, who are grieving in the same way that the Flores family in Peru is grieving for the loss of their daughter, Stephanie. Oh, wow. All right, Kristen Dahlgren, thank you so much. An update now to a story we first brought you yesterday. A widow who wrote a book on grief and is now charged with her husband's murder. This morning, that man's family is speaking out. NBC News correspondent Aaron McLaughlin has that story now. 
Hey there. In the years since her husband's death, Corey Richens had published a book about the grief felt by their children. Now we're learning his family had always suspected she may have been involved in his murder. As court documents reveal new details about the successful businessman's alleged concern for the family's finances. It has been more than a year since the death of Eric Richens. Now the family of the father of three is speaking out, saying they've long been suspicious of his wife, Corey. Does Eric's family believe Corey killed him? I think the family has always felt that Corey was somehow involved in his death. The 33-year-old real estate agent turned children's book author has been charged with his murder. Police alleging she poisoned her 39-year-old husband last March with a massive dose of fentanyl. And according to court documents, Eric's family told investigators it may not have been the first time she'd poisoned him. He felt like Corey was trying to kill him and that if he did die, that she should be investigated for that. Investigators say Eric had recently changed his will and life insurance from his wife to his sister and was looking into a divorce. Two of Eric's friends told detectives he was worried that Corey would kill him for the money and wanted to ensure his kids were taken care of financially. It completely took us all by shock. As Richens was writing this children's book about grief, even promoting it on local TV, investigators were looking into the couple's troubled past. This whole entire place will uh, sleep up to 60 people. The listing agent telling NBC News Corey is currently selling this house purchased just a week after her husband's death. Detectives say the couple had argued about the property which Corey wanted to flip. The agent says this rendering shows plans for a four to six million dollar renovation of the 10 acre estate. But police say Eric told his family he no longer wanted to buy the house because it would lose a significant amount of money. The day after Eric was found dead, investigators say Corey reached a deal on the home. And that same day, threw a party at her house where she was drinking and celebrating with friends. The family felt right at the outset that this had to be a suspicious death. Now with Corey behind bars awaiting her next court hearing, the Richens family is hopeful. Justice will finally bring an end to Eric's tragic story. According to the arrest warrant, the night of the alleged murder, Corey was texting one of her best friends. The friend later telling police she couldn't remember what they'd been messaging about. When police asked the friend to see the texts, they mysteriously gone missing. Corey Richens has not yet entered a plea, but is expected in court next week. Her attorney declined to comment on the case. Back to you. All right, Aaron, thanks so much. New this morning, two FDA advisory panels have voted unanimously in favor of making the O-Pill birth control pill available for over-the-counter sale. That's right. While the FDA still has to make the final decision, it is expected this major ruling will have a large impact on that decision. NBC News medical contributor Dr. Natalie Azar is here with us, of course. So good to see you. So two of the main considerations for the FDA surrounding the decision, excuse me, to make this pill available for general sale are whether or not... <laughs> Consumers will be able to safely use the drug without consultation of a doctor. Yeah. So this is, you know, you're not going getting a prescription, you just yep. buy it over the counter. And also whether people who should not be using it will be aware. Walk us through that. Those were the main two things that the FDA, FDA was looking at. So examples of can you read a prescription label Mm. correctly would be this particular pill mm. because it's progestin only has to be taken for example at the same time every single day mm. mm -hmm. um, you know if you if you miss a dose do you use another form of contraception they wanted to make sure that people could understand that without having a doctor explain it to uh -huh. them um, and secondly mm. would a woman be able to select herself as someone who shouldn't be taking it and the most important contraindication to this you guys is a woman who has a history of breast cancer mm. well guess what the FDA unanimously decided that the risk of harm of not approving it was far, far, far less mm. than the potential for benefit. Not only, what, what are the benefits of having this? Reducing unintended pregnancies, really improving reproductive autonomy, and really improving equitable access for women, especially in marginalized communities who may not have access mm. to a health care provider. Mm. So we know ahead of the vote, the FDA had expressed some speculation about the validity of the data being yeah. used to back the agency's mm -hmm. ruling on this pill. Mm -hmm. Were there concerns valid, and what more do we know about yeah. that? 
you know, so and, and the FDA kind of alerted us to this last week when they when they released their um, briefing documents, and they said they had some issues with the methodology of some of the studies, but nothing that rose to the level of them saying this is that important that we are going to vote no for something like this. And I think one of the biggest things that came through in the conversations was this concept that just because something is over the counter, or I should say, just because something's prescription, that that automatically guarantees compliance. We know mm -hmm. that it doesn't. And there's certainly precedent for a lot of other over-the-counter medications that people can and do take safely and effectively. So, doctor, we know this is a little confusing. That wasn't the official FDA ruling. Yes. This is just a vote from the mm -hmm. advisory panel. Right. Walk us through that nuance and then what that means the next steps are. So, you know, we have a lot of examples of this, let's say in the last two years, Alzheimer's drugs, for example, and an advisory committee will say, yes, we do recommend it or no, we don't recommend it. But they're not the final authority. The final authority comes with the with the FDA proper. These are advisory mm -hmm. committees to the FDA mm -hmm. who we're meeting. We expect that the FDA will probably decide to go with their committee's recommendations. That's why they have a committee of experts. And it was unanimous. So that decision will likely happen sometime over the summer mm. because there doesn't need to be a big ramp up of production. This pill is right. already available by prescription. I think we can expect that it would be on store shelves shortly thereafter. All right. Dr. Azar, thank you so much. Coming up, lost in translation. Yeah, there's a new trend of fake sign language videos on TikTok. Has the deaf community concerned? This is Morning News Now. Welcome back. Well, this is a growing trend on TikTok. Creators signing along to famous songs like We Are the World or Love the Way You Lie, but it's not quite what it seems. Often they're actually showing the wrong sign language. Members of the deaf community say the signs are often meaningless and can be confusing for those trying to follow along. And the National Association for the Deaf recently shared this video condemning unqualified creators and calling the harm this was causing to the deaf community devastating. Amanda Morris is the disability reporter for the Washington Post. She is also, as she puts it, proudly hard of hearing. She joins us now for more insight into this alarming trend. Amanda, good morning. Let's start with how signing to music became a trend on TikTok and tell us what are some of the common mistakes that you're seeing. Yeah, so TikTok is a primarily video-based app and certain sounds or songs will go viral. And uh, if mm -hmm. you do a video that includes that song or sound, then you have a better chance of going viral as well. And so I think, you know, mainstream representation of sign language got a lot of people interested in learning sign language which is great. We've seen movies like Coda and A Quiet Place really raise awareness about the language. Um, but with that interest, there's been an increasing number of people who think that they're doing the right signs or think that they know sign language, um, completely getting it wrong. And a lot of them are signing along to these songs to try to get more followers and get popular on the app. And I've seen a range of mistakes. Um, there's kind of like a, a three categories of mistakes I've seen. One is that you mean to do one sign, but you accidentally do another. So that could be an example, like you're trying to say the word young, which looks like this, uh, but then you accidentally say tired, which looks like this. And if you don't know what you're doing, those small differences mm. can actually make a big difference. Um, another category is that I've seen for lack of a better word, complete gibberish. Um, and that's when mm. somebody changes a sign so much that a deaf or hard of hearing person wouldn't actually understand them. Um, and I've shown my mom and dad, who are both deaf, some popular creators on TikTok and been like, hey, can you understand them? And they've been like, I have no idea what this person's saying. And mm. a lot of other people in the deaf community who I interviewed said the same thing. So an example would be, um, this is the word for lie, as in like, I'm lying to you, right? Um, but I've seen people doing it this way. Uh, which looks completely different and is meaningless in sign language. And then the third mistake I've seen is like translation mistakes. And that's a mistake thinking that every word in English translates perfectly to one sign. Um, and that's not always the case. So for example, the word for like, as in mm -hmm. this ice cream tastes like chocolate, um, would be like this. And that indicates that something is similar. But okay. I've seen people using this sign, which means like, I like ice I cream. Like, right, right. Interesting. Um, talk through what the damage is here. I mean, as Valerie just said, the National Association for the Deaf called this devastating. What does this do to this community? 
Yeah, so a lot of these popular TikTok creators have actually gone on to interpret at live events like concerts or sporting events. Um, and some of them have tried to teach others, whether they're teaching their followers, their friends, local stores, or people in their community. Mm -hmm. um, and that actually is concerning to deaf and hard of hearing people because they say that that's spreading the incorrect signs. Um, and so it increases the risk that a deaf person might go to an event and there's an interpreter there mm. and actually it's all wrong and the deaf person has no idea what's going on. Mm. And it increases the risk that deaf people will, you know, meet somebody who comes up and says, hey, I know sign language, I want to talk to you. And they, they, they cannot communicate and the deaf person has to then try to correct them and reteach them, which is kind of exhausting. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for raising awareness about this topic, Amanda. Yeah. It's very important. Thank you so much, Amanda Morris. Thank you. Good to have you. Coming up, Thanks a health for... warning this morning from our own Morgan Chesky. After the break, he will be here to talk about his recent brush with a pretty scary condition after what seemed like a normal hiking trip ended in the ICU. Stay with us. Welcome back. It's not summer just yet, but if you're planning to escape to the mountains on vacation, we have a warning for you this morning. Yeah, for more on this, we are joined by someone with personal experience of this and someone you probably know at home, our friend NBC News correspondent Morgan Chesky. Morgan, it is <laughs> great to just see you generally. It is great to know that you are okay because you had this scary experience after a hiking trip, and we're so lucky that you are sharing this story with us to help others. Yeah, good morning, guys. So I feel very lucky to be here, and it was incredibly frightening. First time in an ambulance, first time in ICU. All after a diagnosis that after hiking my entire life, I had never heard of once. High altitude pulmonary edema or HAPE. And very fortunately for me, I had a lot of help catching it just in time. Hitting a trail, preferably in mountains, has been a favorite pastime for pretty much ever. Which is why I could have never imagined a trip to Bryce Canyon and Zion National Parks would end here on oxygen in ICU. I guess you could call this my first uh, hike since the trip. <laughs> uh, let's don't go that far. <laughs> okay. Uh, I would call this a stroll. My uncle Eric, part of the tight knit crew converging to hike Utah's finest. We hit Bryce day one, trails topping 8,000 feet. I've hiked higher before, but this time started feeling off. You were moving just a little slower, so that's why I continued to watch you like a hawk. The next day at Zion was worse. Pictures hiding how lightheaded and weak I felt with a pulse that was skyrocketing. I'm having to stop every 50 yards just to catch my breath. Or, or a lot less than that. It brought me back 22 years ago when we were in Breckenridge with your dad and he had almost the exact same symptoms. Symptoms that days later led to losing my dad to a heart attack at just 48 from a blocked artery knowing I was in trouble, but not exactly why. Uncle Eric grabbed my pack. You're 100% maxed, you're done. It was a miracle that you got out. The next miracle, making it to Cedar City Hospital. After helping me off the trail, Uncle Eric drove me to a clinic an hour away. They called an ambulance. When my oxygen levels came back half of what they should be. Your CT scan looked like it came from the textbook. Dr. Jared Gray raced me in for tests, finding my lungs filling with fluid. He diagnosed me with HAPE, or high altitude pulmonary edema, a respiratory condition that typically strikes those who ascend rapidly to elevations, topping 8,000 feet. All of your capillaries in your lungs started leaking, and so it's harder for oxygen to go across. If untreated, Doc told me you either pass out from lack of oxygen or go into cardiac arrest. In February, that's exactly what happened to 58-year-old John Magnus, an accomplished hiker who climbed Argentina's Mount Aconcagua, topping 22,000 feet. But hours later, his family says he passed away from hape-induced cardiac arrest. He was a very physically fit person. His family now speaking out to share a warning for others. It can happen to anyone plan ahead and, and, and be, be prepared as best as you can um, for emergency scenarios. As for me, quality care and lower elevation did wonders. Not to mention a guy who made sure I was going to make it back home. You know, much well, love for having my back out there. Yeah, well, you know, I love you like my son and 
I know, man. Appreciate you, brother. Oh my goodness, Morgan, just so powerful to share the, what's happened to you, share your personal story with your dad. Mm. We are so happy that you are here and you're okay. Thank you. But how are you feeling? How are you doing right now? Doctors told me to stay in Utah for a couple days to make sure that my body was fully, okay. you know, at least on the path to recovery. And then I, I can't stress enough how quickly you can feel better by going to a lower elevation. That is the biggest way to alleviate the symptoms of HAPE, uh, but it, mm. incredibly scary. And then I did have to take an antibiotic because there was a, a respiratory infection that came along with that. The doctors tell me actually made me more prone uh, to this high altitude pulmonary edema, a term I had never heard despite yeah. growing up hiking. Oh my gosh, we have to go, but just quickly, will you hike again? Maybe Absolutely. Okay. Uh, walking along a beach sounds very exciting right now, <laughs> but doctors tell me I can hit the mountains. I just need to really build in an extra day, even two, to acclimatize so that my body is able to handle that elevation. Absolutely. And great just things to keep in mind. Trust your body. If something is up, go Absolutely. check it out. Morgan Chesky, we are so glad you're okay. Good and we are you. very grateful to you for sharing your story. It's so good much. to see you. Well, let's get to some financial headlines now. We'll start with some bad news for full-time employees at Microsoft. Those yearly pay bumps are not happening this year at the tech giant. CNBC Markets reporter Pippa Stevens has that and more money news. Pippa, good morning. Hey, Valerie. Well, Microsoft is freezing pay for full-time employees this year, another sign of tech companies tightening their belts amid worries about a slowing economy. But Microsoft will still offer promotions, bonuses, and stock awards to employees. Last month, the company said growth was subdued in the first three months of the year as economic concerns have affected demand for its software and cloud services. Meantime, Robinhood plans to offer trading of select stocks and exchange traded funds 24 hours a day, five days a week. The brokerage will allow round-the-clock trading between 8 p.m. on Sunday and 8 p.m. on Friday in 43 stocks, including popular names like Amazon, Apple, and Tesla. It will begin rolling out the feature next week, and all customers should have it by June. Over time, Robinhood will make more stocks and ETFs available for overnight trading. And couples looking for more personalized wedding gifts can now create a registry on Etsy. Guests will be able to search for and buy gifts off pages on the platform, including handmade and vintage items. Couples can also add custom gifts and specify names, colors, designs, or other personalized categories that sellers offer. Friends and family shopping from a registry won't need to have an Etsy account. Everyone trying to capitalize on the wedding industry. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, isn't that right? All right, Pippa, thank you so much. Well, coming up, turning pain into purpose. After the break, we'll introduce you to a super mom who's not only in charge of her five kids, but also one of the country's premier hotels. We've got her story next. Finally, this hour, a mom who turns her pain into purpose. Today's show co-host Jenna Bush Hager sat down with the proprietor of one of the most renowned hotel properties in the country, hearing how she tackles family and business while living out her husband's dreams. As the sun rises in the Tennessee Smoky Mountains, the staff at Blackberry Mountain are already hard at work and the visitors just starting to stir. At the helm of it all, Mary Celeste Bell, in a role she never dreamed would be hers. You say that Blackberry Mountain healed you in many ways. How so? Sam and I had dreamed about Blackberry Mountain for years, bringing his vision to life and making sure that we were doing everything that we wanted to do and that he dreamed of has been just an incredible journey. You met Sam in high school. Do you remember your first impressions of him? He, of course, was great looking. <laughs> <laughs> he was warm and friendly and fun and he had kind of a magnetism to him. That magnetism naturally drew people to Sam, his colleagues, his guests, and his children. At 26, Sam Bell began running Blackberry Farm, a property owned by his parents. Once he turned that resort into a world-renowned culinary destination, he set his eyes to the mountains. He loved getting out and exploring. He loved to hike. I mean, Blackberry Mountain, he hiked and biked every inch of it. He loved blazing a trail. He was kind of fearless. When Sam died in a tragic ski accident in 2016, he left his wife with five children, 5,200 acres of uncharted land, and a dream. There was just immediate talking of like, how are we gonna do this? And so I found myself over those days, over and over just saying, I know we're gonna be okay. 
The Bell family decided Mary Celeste should be the one to bring Sam's dream to fruition. And she did just that. But that also must have been slightly daunting. I mean, you have five children. You were very young. You were in your 30s. Were you scared? I wasn't scared. It was really so healing to have to get up and get dressed and show up somewhere. Yes. And I wasn't always on time. <laughs> Still, I'm not very good at that. But have adult conversations and not be dwelling on yeah. what we're losing. But the other thing that was so amazing is that it was such a connection to Sam. Seven years later, Mary Celeste oversees 1,200 employees and is involved in the day-to-day -day business at both Blackberry Farm and Blackberry Mountain, all while raising her children who range in age from 10 years old to 25 years old. What would they say about their dad? They would say that he loved them, that he was committed and passionate about things he loved, but I think they would say that they miss him and they wish he was here. But they know how special it was to have him for the time they did. And they appreciate that. Yeah. With Blackberry Mountain thriving, Mary Celeste has a new goal, to change the conversation around grief. Loss is universal and there's no universal conversation about it. You say that there's hope after healing. There is some beautiful light that comes. Well, I think that difficult times give you perspective, and there is hope, and you just have to appreciate every day. A guest actually gave you a really important book that I know has been sort of a safe haven for you. And then you gave one to me when I lost my grandparents who you knew I loved. The book is called Healing After Loss by Martha Hickman. Even if I could, I will not forget my pain. I will honor it. It is part of who I am. Do you feel that way about your pain too? I feel so fortunate to have lived the life that I've lived. And loving someone so much that you miss them so much is a gift. But I also think that at some point you have to let go and so I am letting go of my pain. I want to celebrate what I had, and I also want to live on. Beautiful story and a beautiful place. Yeah. Jenna Bush Hager, thank you so much. That does it for this hour of Morning News Now. But stick with us because the news continues right now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.